It's been called the continent's number one growth industry. And in the past year, it's brought in more revenue than all major sports combined. Its gross receipts are larger than the movie business and the recording industry together. It's the seductive world of video games, a world which demands of its devotees enormous commitments in time and involvement. In return, it confers the illusion of power at 25 cents a shot. not just of the game, but of the world. It only costs 25 cents to take part in this apocalyptic world, but for the gods who created it, it is worth billions. Kill, babe. Among other things, it is a world requiring keen eye and hand coordination, tremendous concentration, and above all, a passion to confront the dangers, fears, and challenges of another world with simple virtuosity. It is the world of video games. <laughs> Do you sometimes feel you're in a rut, that life has become boring and routine? Well, in a sparsely furnished office in a rundown section of Chicago, there's a young man with a mission. For some time, he has been designing very successful video games, which are supposed to put you back in the driver's seat. Eugene Jarvis, at 27, considers himself an old-timer in the video games business. The hit games he has designed include Defender and Robotron. Well, it's, it's sort of the, it's the ultimate fantasy where you are the the only force left between evil and good and of course in our normal day lives we we a lot of times we get the feeling that we just don't really matter you know we just we're there but if i did my job or i didn't do my job nobody would notice you know uh because society is so big and here you are where you're on the line and and, and it's like things really count here and, and sometimes in real life it seems like it doesn't really matter what i do things are just going to go the way they go Within months of appearing on the market in 1981, his game Defender shot to the top and stayed there. For Williams, the company that owned it, his idea was worth $100 million. You're flying a spaceship, and you're the number one guy out there, and it's up to you. You're responsible for what happens to this planet that you're protecting from the alien menace. And you can, you can blow it or you can, you can succeed, and... and I think it really gives you a sense of, of accomplishment if you're, if you're able to stave off uh, the uh, humanoid holocaust for a, a few attack ways and keep mankind going that much longer. Uh, it's, sort of, uh, it's the ultimate fantasy where you're, you're saving mankind from destruction. Shortly after the success of Defender, Jarvis left the company and started his own partially because he wasn't attracted enough by the bonus they offered him, and partially because he finds any corporate structure too stuffy. Designer salaries range between twenty and forty thousand dollars a year, with no share of the profits. It was here that he next designed Robotron, in which the player must save the last human family on the planet from robots. They are trying to capture them for their zoo. He is now working on a new design, which he estimates will take up to a year to complete. And not unlike the pop music trade, you're only as good as your last hit. This year's hit is next year's uh, firewood. and uh, It's that tough, this business. It, it is. I mean, three years from now, you'll, you'll ask somebody what Defender was, and they'll, and they'll go, hmm, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a very fast-moving thing. Players, the one thing they do, they don't like to get stuck in the same reality. Just like they don't like to get stuck in real life, they don't like to get stuck on the same game for... for any, lo any length of time, because then it starts getting uh, to be what they're trying to escape. There are over a million video machines now in place across North America. Most of them have been built and assembled here in the Atari factory in California. It all began with a game called Pong in 1972 and an investment of $500. Four years later, Warner Communications bought Atari for $28 million. Last year, its estimated sales totaled 900 million. A billion dollar empire so that everyone can be their own star. A few hours from Hollywood in Lakewood, California, Phil's Video Arcade is hosting the first annual video championships. It is a three day marathon pitting the best in California against the best in North Carolina. No prizes have been offered other than the normal adulation that comes with breaking another world record. Antonio's just broken his own world record.
The previous record was 5,600,000. The current record now is 6,198,490. New scores are recorded every 15 minutes and monitored in a central computer in Iowa. In his hourly phone calls to North Carolina, arcade owner Phil Iatti checks the latest numbers. Okay, I'm just going to get an update. Any changes in Centipede? Um, how about Pac-Man? Anything higher than 299? How about Stargate? Did you start that guy off? Okay, counting it up, it's somewhere around, um, at the moment, about 7 and 10 for us. We got about 7 games there, and it's uh, 10 for us. And there's still a few, a couple more that have to be decided. He's cooking. He's, he's, he's probably sleeping now, but he'll be cooking later. Play continued through the night. Several New World records were set, then broken again. Those less skilled took on some older and less challenging games, while others were content simply to watch history in the making. And like all makers of history, sometimes the pressures at a critical moment can be unbearable. What kind of movement do you notice? What kind of movements do you notice? Mostly punching, kicking, screaming. And, you know, you don't look like the type, you look really cool. I do. How come the machine gets under your skin like that? Well, my mind gets concentrated on one thing and if I'm just looking at the screen for hours and hours and uh, something goes wrong after I'm almost going to beat a high score, it does kind of get you nervous and mad and all that. And here is what can make you kick and scream. One of the many tiny mass-produced brains which may cost as little as 99 cents. Closer examination reveals the crisscrossed pathways of thousands of semiconductors, microscopic highways of photo-etched silicon that can instantly be directed to ridicule, destroy, or praise you. To determine just when video creatures do what they do, Atari designers and technicians gather at a villa to conduct regular brainstorming sessions. And here, like co-authors in a high-tech fantasy play, each creature is given a character and script. Well, as deadlier and deadlier. As one obstacle, the snake eats the gun. Yeah. Just touching it, eats the gun. No, it eats it. Uh, is it physically trying to hit the base or...? Main idea is something I dropping a la... Snakey. A la Space Invaders. It must have a motivation to... Gravity. Gravity. <laughs> Gravity. Okay. It's a fantasy, but curiously enough, um, in, in, our, in our efforts to escape reality and... and and go into these imaginary realms, we're, we're, we're reassured by good things like gravity or having two arms and two legs or a big mouth to eat things with or something, you know, and, and a lot of our fantasy really does relate to reality, I think, and in, in some ways perhaps um, exaggerated, such as Pac-Man, where your, your whole being is, is condensed on down to being a massive uh, digestive tract. And, and, and consuming dots and, and you know and, and but we're we're familiar with that and that's it's it's a pleasurable thing to do. To further understand the secret pleasures of eating dots, we went to Davis, California, population thirty six thousand. A laid back university town known for its research into solar energy, and a claim to have more bicycles per capita than any other town in North America. Now on the list, Pac-Man capital of the world. And here in a video parlor called the library, we find out why. In the land of fast food chains, consumers' appetite for Pac-Man has pushed its lifetime sales to number one. This man, Ed Bosso, 22 and working on his PhD in math, discovered that there was a definite pattern of travel in Pac-Man which prevented capture. He had broken the computer's program and become a national hero. Have you become some sort of a celebrity around Davis because of your achievement, Ed? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to say yes. Uh, a lot of people recognize me around arcades and similar places. A lot of times I'll be playing a game and I'll hear a little kid in the back say, hey, hey, I know who that is, Ed Basil. You get a kick out of him? Oh yeah, really? always. But doesn't it take the fun out of the game now that you have broken the pattern? Where's well, the challenge? You're right. It, it has taken the fun out of the game and I don't play much anymore. Um, I've played a couple times to amuse friends, but that's about it. Uh, I got two million points once and played for three and a half hours. I walked away with uh, three of my men left, and since then I've never really played a serious game. 
interest in video games has also spawned a lucrative secondary industry in publishing. Countless books, magazines, and articles now vie for the privilege of providing the best clues to understanding the games. Craig Cuby, formerly a lawyer for Ralph Nader, has written a book on how to beat the games, what one reviewer has called the best video volume in the universe. It's amusing on the outside, but serious on the inside. Do you have to be aggressive? Do you have to be competitive? I think both those things are, are very helpful, yes. I think uh, the more you sort of attack the machine, attack the game, the better you do. You fire off a lot of shots, you concentrate a great deal. If your mind is somewhere else, your score is going to be low. Why is this such a great machine? It is a, an extraordinarily addictive machine because if you lose, you don't lose by much. Also, if you, if you lose, uh, uh, if you're destroyed, it's, it's particularly humiliating. There's this sound uh, uh, of an explosion as though uh, it, uh, there's been a hand grenade detonated in a garbage can and you're in the can. And you don't, you don't, you don't like that. You want to avoid that. Let me understand that. this. This machine humiliates you if you don't do well? Somewhat, yes. Now why don't you put the quarter in? What you do here is you, you, you fire and, and blow away as many of these uh, space turkeys as possible. Uh, but you blow them away in a certain order. They're very hostile when you fly. I don't the like space these guys. They, they, they've been destroying me since 1979. You start to personalize the game. You don't just see this, these figures as, as some sort of animation on some uh, uh, piece of electronic machinery. You see them as the enemy, and an enemy that's bent on uh, destroying you. In addition, uh, uh, it's important, uh, once you know much about video games, to do well, because you know that video games mean something about you. It's not just a matter of chance or luck. You know that if you've done well, you've concentrated well, you've developed good strategies. And if you get really good, you can, you can uh, uh, not only uh, control your little laser base, but you can absolutely master the game to the extent you can show off on it, do things that no one else uh, can do. All that for only a quarter. All that for only a quarter. You really do get upset every time one of those little bombs hits one of your little men there and it goes kaboom. Yeah, it, it can be upsetting. Actually, for me, it's often a, a learning as well. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, sorry that. That was that. humiliating. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Um, see, what happened there was, was I, was, I was distracted. Forgive me. Uh, this is, I'm... This is against the, the yeah. etiquette of, of the pit. Well, as you know, my background is in law, and I think we could settle this out of court for, for another quarter. It's an interactive television set. It's, it's participatory cinema. It's, uh, it's a way in which you can uh, react and, and have feedback and, and exist within the reality of the TV set. In this game, the player reacts to war. I don't die so easy. The TV reality here is complete with the choppers of an old TV war. The simulated battles of the video games have also interested the United States Army. Die, son. They have asked Atari to produce a model that would be suitable as an inexpensive trainer to augment the recruits' field experience. By everyone's calculation, video games are here to stay for at least a while. <laughs> Atari certainly thinks so. This past year, they have spent an estimated $20 million in research and development. Before a game hits the streets, management takes it for a test drive to iron out any wrinkles. The revised game is then previewed by sample players. They know their reactions are being monitored by the designers who watch through a two-way mirror. They're hoping for another big winner, like Space Invaders, which grossed $2 billion. Four times the gate receipts of Star Wars. Two billion, a quarter at a time. They're almost everywhere, and this is at a time uh, for both Canada and the United States, uh, when the economy is in a certain amount of trouble. 10% of the people in the U.S. are unemployed, so they may not have time uh, to invest in a $20 Broadway play or a $1,000 uh, trip to some resort area, but they have a quarter. The average life of any game is eight months, the peak of its money-making and record-setting interest. And for players and designers alike, it is a world of hero today and gone tomorrow. Antonio Mendia has just now broken his own world's record. 